Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? This week's news items include uh, further discoveries relating to the way that Staph aureus, or more commonly called Golden Staph, manages to uh, hide within the human body and come out at the worst possible times. Developments with uh, drugs and weight loss, specifically around a type 2 diabetes drug called Ozempic. New York scientists are working hard at genetically modifying food to make our agricultural industry that much more resilient. Further genetic modifications are being conducted with fruit flies in order to reduce the threat they pose to that same industry. And finally, the parasitic eels found within the hearts of a shark, and it's as unnerving as it sounds. The timestamps for these and other news items can be found in the description box below. Let's start with staph, and particularly how staph becomes a superbug, or a medication-resistant bacterium, and then causes all kinds of problems, but particularly things like flesh-eating bacteria, necrotizing fasciitis as it's probably called, you also have issues around sepsis, and worse case scenario, death. As weird as it is to say, Staph is something that is a commensurate species, it lives on our skin all the time, and to a certain extent there's also an amount of it within our nasal cavity, GI tract, and a few other locations. It's normal flora. The problem is, when it breaks free and, well, in this instance, becomes drug resistant, we have a problem. Normally, if you get sepsis, you basically either have to be treated aggressively with antibiotics, or you die. It's one or the other. The question though is, how does staph stay alive within the human body? And that's where it becomes quite difficult. Generally speaking, it hides within the host cells, and that's why it can't be detected properly. And the researchers were trying to figure out how it does that without destroying those same cells. By hiding within the host cells, it's able to avoid most of what the immune system can do to detect it and therefore remove it. It also, to a certain extent, protects it from antibiotics, as it's not directly exposed to the antibiotic in your plasma or blood. While the researchers don't have an exact answer to that, they have managed to develop a model. It's called Intoxa, or Intracellular Toxicity of S. aureus, Staph aureus. And this is hopefully going to shed at least some light, if not all possible light, on what it is that they do to, well, survive in the worst possible circumstances. We then have berberine. Berberine is a alternative treatment for diabetes, specifically type 2 diabetes. The problem with this is that it's a natural replacement. And in the words of Tim Minchin, alternative medicine that works is just called medicine. And that's true of natural replacements as well. If your supplement really worked, it wouldn't be classified as a supplement. It would be a medication. Berberine is meant to take up the place of something called Ozempic. Ozempic being a type 2 diabetes medication. It has two major roles. One is that it interacts and basically replaces a glucagon-like peptide. And this helps to... Uh, increase the amount of insulin available. The second is that it reduces the production of glucagon, which is supposed to decrease insulin production. By increasing the normal production levels of insulin and decreasing signals to tell you not to make it, your body should theoretically produce more. And this is all well and good. It's been proven to work and it's fairly effective. At the moment, however, most insulin medications are temperamental in their availability. As such, this is being sold as an alternative that can be used in lieu of being able to buy what is, frankly, in the case of America, ridiculously expensive insulin products. For the rest of the world, hard to access, but at least far more affordable. Berberine is what's being sold as the natural replacement or alternative, and unfortunately, it's really just an ammonium salt with... It's not any different in terms of its special features, let's say, and then something like turmeric and curcumin are, or similar. Many different plants have it in reasonably large amounts, so this does raise some concerns about knowing just what exactly it is that you're getting. As we've described in the past, when it comes to supplements, there's practically no regulation around them. 
And that's a massive problem, as bold claims can be made, and until they're disproven, they're allowed to make them. Particularly if they use arguments like traditionally used for, or culturally acceptable, that sort of bullshit reasoning. And that's the issue here. Berberine has no evidence to support its use for type 2 diabetes, yet it's being sold in this situation where actual effective medication in the form of a Zempic are not available, and therefore, to a certain extent, ripping off individuals. In other news related to that, we have developments around a Zempic and claims that it's particularly beneficial for weight loss. Now, in none too delicate terms, Obesity is closely associated with diabetes, and that's because in order to become diabetic, you generally have a very high sugar intake level over a long period of time, leading you to become obese. Therefore, one of the suggestions to help manage type 2 diabetes is to lose weight and to uh, maintain a uh, more reasonable and modest diet. Ozempic helps at least in terms of weight loss, and that's because of what it does. We mentioned how it plays with the uh, hormones within the body, but particularly when talking about the hormones related to feelings of fullness and complete satiety after eating. Ozempic is a glucagon-like peptide. In other words, it's a protein that's very similar to glucagon, which is one of the normal hormones the human body produces to tell you that you are full and therefore changes the way the body metabolizes things. Because it's artificially telling you that you're full sooner, you therefore eat less. And, quite simply put, the less you eat, the less energy goes into your body, the less you're going to store if you're not using it. And if you're using it, you wind up with a net deficit and therefore lose weight. It's relatively simple. Of course, the Zempic is not without risk, but most of those risks have been at least largely mitigated, and there have been several countries, such as the USA, that have approved Ozempic for use in weight loss particularly. The downside to this is that, well, it takes away doses of a diabetes medication from diabetics and gives them to obese individuals, which, to be quite blunt, of the two, the diabetics need it far more than those who are obese, and certainly for the fact that they really didn't have any say in becoming diabetic necessarily. In other news that's research related, we have the million dollar loss from a janitor turning off a very specialized freezer used for storage of research samples and materials. Yeah, it's cost over one million dollars due to a freezer that was playing up in the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute lab in Troy. The freezer was making a annoying sound as its alarm went off saying it wasn't able to maintain the proper temperature, which is already concerned for the research samples, and any other reagents that are stored within it. But ignoring that for now, we have the further effect of the janitor thinking that they were turning on the breaker or switch for the freezer, not turning it off. And unfortunately, because they turned it off, everything in the freezer defrosted or thawed, and as a result became so damaged it can no longer be used. That's 25 years worth of research gone just like that. Ignoring the fact that this was a ridiculous situation, we have two other aspects to this. One, that the janitor did not read the sign on the front of the freezer saying, if the alarm is happening, you can do these things to moot it for 5 to 10 minutes. And as a result, they chose instead to turn it off. The second is that the freezer was scheduled to be fixed in late September. That means this freezer that's storing research specimens and reagents would have been out of action, or at best, would have had a unpredictable reliability for three months, while waiting for what is likely to be a very expensive repair for a very expensive freezer. Further news that's related to research, but shifting to agriculture, and it's the uh, sort of good news, bad news situation. The good news is that we have somebody who is well respected, who's working towards genetically modifying various agricultural products to be able to make the world a better place. The downside to this is that they've been diagnosed with terminal cancer, and sadly, they're likely to die well before the American government gives approval for their Darling 58 American chestnut tree to be made available. Yeah.
the work they're doing is not necessarily groundbreaking in terms of it being especially popular, an in-demand product or similar. Rather, it's focusing on restoring a native and common species to North America, the American chestnut tree. And this is being done because unfortunately they've been threatened through a number of different issues, whether that is environmental change, deforestation, simply choosing to cut them down and remove them so that something else can be placed there. The American chestnut is simply no longer available to the same extent it was. But the worst case scenario is going to be blight. Unfortunately, the American chestnut tree is particularly vulnerable to a form of blight. In further genetically modified organism news relating to agriculture, we have a soybean that is more protein filled than other soybean equivalents by taking genes from pigs, and it has been named Piggy Soy. It's a soybean made with pig genes. It's not quite Bertie McBoat face levels of creativity, but it's certainly at least easy to remember. It's a project made by a UK-based company called Mulek, and the idea was fundamentally to modify the soya beans and increase their proteins, particularly their soluble proteins, by taking pig genes and placing them within it. This is helpful as it significantly increases the protein content and it does allow for it to theoretically be used as a much better protein supplement than other soybean equivalents. Of course, this is not the only similar project they're running. They also have pea plants that have beef proteins present, and several others. Interestingly, you'll note that compared to the more normally yellow soya bean colour, these are slightly pink, and that's because one of the genes that was added is the haemoglobin gene, which is helpful for adding to the uh, possible health benefits, particularly around those who are vegetarian or vegan, and don't get adequate iron intake. In further news related to agriculture, but shifting to animals as well, well, more accurately insects, the genetic modification of fruit flies, but targeting the fruit flies in the USA and Europe. The idea is relatively straightforward. Drosophila or fruit flies are a massive pain. They damage the agricultural areas, particularly around fruit production, on a massive scale. It's because they get into things like apples, pears, peaches, and so on, and begin to eat them by laying their larvae on them, and the larvae make them, well, less than desirable. Further to that, there are other products that are just as vulnerable, like berries for instance. The only way to really control it is either to have extremely strict quarantine methods, or to spray aggressively with pesticides. Both of these are difficult. One is certainly far less desirable than the other. The idea here is by genetically modifying some of the flies and releasing them, they can outcompete the unmodified fruit flies and therefore theoretically breed. But the problem is they won't actually reproduce, and as a result, you will have a reduction in the fruit fly population. This is the same underlying idea behind tests of a similar project using mosquitoes and an attempt to prevent mosquitoes acting as a vector sterilize one half of the reproductive cycle and prevent them from producing offspring. No offspring means no issues to do with them continuing to spread disease. In animal news, and particularly marine animal news, we have expanding issues with them being somewhat aggressive. We have the continuing issues of orcas attacking sail ships, but now dolphins are doing so as well. We were expecting them to say so long and thanks for all the fish, not decide to rise up and take over the world. In this case, reports come from a university in Australia called the University of Queensland that says dolphins are teaching each other to beg for fish from boats that are passing nearby. The final bit of news we have for you is also marine animal related, but somewhat more disconcerting. It's parasitic eels within the heart of a shark. While Sharknado, Jaws, and similar all would make you think that sharks are the evil baddies of all. They aren't, for the most part. To be quite blunt, they rarely would harm humans, and, well, as an animal will, they do what it takes to survive. Unfortunately, in this case, autopsies of them have shown that there are 
more lessons to be learned from the wild than just dog eats dog. Its tiny parasitic eel eats shark. The eels themselves are called the snub-nosed eel, and they're not actually required to be parasitic. It's something that they can do facultatively. For the most part, they can quite happily live on the bottom of the ocean, feeding on the remains of anything that's died, scavenging to their heart's content, much like a hyena. But no, they can also burrow into the flesh of a much larger creature and feed on that instead. And that's where this rather unpleasant article goes into considerably more detail on just what exactly is happening, and it is rather unpleasant. Largely speaking, they found at least two, if not three, examples of eels burrowing their way all the way into the shark, and at least in one case, sitting in the heart of the shark, feeding on the blood that goes through it. There is now a new top dog in the marine sciences, the snub-nosed eel, putting both whales and sharks out of that position, leaving only dolphins to fight for it, given that they are assholes. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below 